knees of liberty. Let our rejoice, sing, sing, rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Oh, sing. A song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought Facing the rising sun of a new day be begun. Let us march on till victory. Let us march on. Till victory, let us march on. Till victory, is is one. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. Mm. In order for us to effectively reach multiple facets of the Black community, we work closely with our community partners. As I call your organization, I'm trying to compose myself because I was really powerful. Thank you, Caroline. As I call your organization, please use the hand raise feature at the bottom of your screen. After all partners are called, we'd like to take a group photo. Some of our partners, many longstanding, include the Columbus, Ohio chapter of the Lynx Incorporated, the Twin Rivers, Ohio chapter of the Lynx Incorporated, the Columbus Buffalo Soldiers Motorcycle Club, New Salem Baptist Church, the National Panhellenic Council of Columbus, Columbus Public Health, Franklin County Public Health, Primary One Health, and of course, the African-American Male Wellness Agency, who we'll hear from shortly. So any of you that are here, we'd love to take a partner photo really quickly. Do we have that? Larice on your cue. I see the Delta president with us today. Good afternoon. Larice, do we have it? Can you, we're waiting on you. We need some cues here. I'm grabbing it. Oh, okay. Abe, you got it? You're ready? Like we need time so we can smile right. Got it. Right. Let's take it. Okay. It's just pulling everybody in. Looking good. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you so much. As we celebrate Black History Month, it's important for us to pay homage to our local history. 
This year, Trinity Baptist Church is celebrating their centennial celebration. And Dr. Victor Davis, pastor of Trinity Baptist Church, who also serves on our African-American Advisory Council, um, is here with us today. So Dr. Davis, uh, welcome again. And would you share a little bit about Trinity's history and your upcoming centennial celebration? Thank you, Demia. It is my pleasure to be with you today as we celebrate this wonderful opportunity to celebrate our history, especially in the life of Lifeline Ohio. I am blessed to have served as the fifth pastor of the Trinity Baptist Church now. We will be celebrating our 100th church anniversary on the third Sunday of May, May 19th, 2024. Trinity Baptist Church was started as the Evergreen Baptist Church by a few faithful members from North Carolina West and West Virginia and Virginia. And since that time, the church has maintained a presence in the Near East Side of Columbus, committing themselves to life-changing ministry for those residents here and abroad. Trinity has had five pastors, um, Pastor Green, Pastor Phillips, Pastor Scarborough, Pastor E.A. Parham, and myself. Pastor Parham, Pastor Scarborough, and myself are Shaw University graduates at Historically HBCU located in Raleigh, North Carolina. And all five of us are from North Carolina. We have an interesting connection. None of us knew each other prior to our serving here. Reverend Scarborough served as the mayor of Bronzeville during the 30s and the 40s, representing the African-American populace with the powers to be in the political field downtown Columbus. Reverend Parham served this church for 47 years prior to his retirement. He was well known as a stalwart and a stabilizing force here in this community and throughout the nation. Reverend Scarborough and Reverend Parham served as the president of the National um, Lock Care Reform Missions Convention, which is an African-American Baptist convention that meets the needs of people here in America and abroad. And Trinity serves as the oldest membered um, church in Columbus and in the organization, and we continue to do that today. Presently in 2024, Trinity Baptist Church is committing to serving people here in the community by extending our footprint through providing diverse and life-changing ministry that people will come to know who Christ is by how we serve them. We are presently getting ready to break ground in 2025 for the 84 unit senior housing complex right here in the community. And it is our hope that we will be starting on a new sanctuary in the near future. We are blessed to be able to serve the people of this church, of this community, as well as the world through the support and prayers of those who we come in contact with. Thank you, Dr. Davis. I'm so grateful for your leadership and for the work that Trinity is doing in the community. Um, and we're just, we're grateful to have you. And I, I just want to personally thank you on behalf of Lifeline of Ohio for um, lending your expertise about donation from the clergy perspective and always opening doors for us in the community. I, I have said that um, getting on a black pastor's calendar is like getting on the calendar of the president of the United States. But I can tell you, and I will say this publicly, that I have been in meetings where we were trying to work through some type of an initiative in the black community. And you have pulled out your phone and said, who, who do we want? And called that pastor right there and handed me the phone and made those connections for us. I'm grateful for you. And as we celebrate Trinity and its centennial, I also want to honor you. So thank you, Dr. Davis. Thank you. I forgot to talk about the several members in our congregation who are donors and recipients of donations. And um, we are committed to continuing to support the work of making sure that life gives life. So I just wanted to mention that. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Davis. We appreciate you. And for anyone who would like to attend uh, the Centennial um, Celebration, you can visit uh, the Trinity Baptist Church website, and um, I believe you can get um, ticket information there. Thank it's you free. again. It, it's oh, it's free? free? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Mm -hmm. 
All right, well, we got that's the way we do it, Trinity. (laughs) (laughs) Of course, again, thank you, Dr. Davis. We appreciate having you, all of your work with the Advisory Council, and certainly all the work of Trinity Baptist. So as we are working with all of our partners to combat the disparity in the Black community for the need for organized tissue donation, understanding that Black people are three times more likely to need a transplant than any other ethnicity, we, we think about that need. And so as we want to amplify that need for understanding, we'd like to share a video. I started dialysis in August of 2004, and then I was able to get my first transplant from my sister in December of 2005. You know, I was able to do more with my children, just do a lot of things that I didn't have the energy for when I was on um, dialysis. And then in the summer of 2021, my doctor was like, you know, it's time. And I don't know that I thought my sister's kidney would last forever, but it was doing a pretty good job. You know, it was like 16, almost 17 years old. I felt kind of invincible. And so when the numbers started dwindling, I was like, oh no, this not me. I go to a clinic three days a week uh, for three and a half hours and I'm working full time. So I go to work and then on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I go to dialysis for three and a half hours. I don't want to spend the next 20 years of my life on dialysis. You know, my kidney's gonna come. God has done it before, he's gonna do it again. That's all, that's all I know. He's, he's done it before and he's gonna do it again. He's gonna do it again. First steps, Benita and the Great new work. kidney. Benita, Benita, are you with us today? Um, yeah, I just, every time I see that, I get a little teary eyed. So sorry. They don't know. Benita, they don't know. They don't know what happened on the rooftop. They don't understand. <laughs> when we Ooh. launched, when this video launched, yeah. Benita got her call five days later as we stood on that rooftop in agreement. That's There's right. something happening on that rooftop, something happening yeah. in that launch. Benita, how are you feeling? How are you doing? Um, I'm doing great. Good afternoon to everyone. And as you know, that video just makes me teary when I see it because whew, the goodness of God, oh, it's, it just gives me chills when I think about how everything happened. And especially as I sit here today thinking it's a Wednesday and a year ago, I'd be going to dialysis. And now I am almost eight months post-transplant. So God is good. God is good. Um, And so I know I'm supposed to keep it short. So what I, what I want to say today is the power of donation is so great. Um, And I'm going to use a quote from uh, Coach Woody Hayes at The Ohio State University for my gratitude statement. You can never really pay back. You can only pay forward. And so I am committed to paying it forward by sharing my story, by encouraging people to be um, organ, eye and tissue donors um, wherever I go. I am living proof. I am a living testimony, and I will never stop um, promoting this cause or the goodness of God who allowed this to happen, not once, but twice. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Benita. And I, I the, the voice in the video is I was actually there with Benita, and she just, there were moments that we um, stopped and she prayed for the donor family. And she talked about the donor the entire time. Um, and just when you hear Benita's story, when you when you talk to Benita, you're always going to hear her reference God and her donor and that gratitude for both. And so we're just, we're so grateful. Um, and we continue to just uplift that family um, who made that decision in, the, in a moment of tragedy that... Um, 
definitely helped save Benita's life, but we also recognize that donor as well. So thank you so much, Benita. Thank you for sharing. And it's You're such welcome. a great- Can I just add one more thing? Yesterday, oh. I did a videotape for um, Columbus City Schools for our wellness initiative. And I shared my story again. And just to reiterate, donation is such a bittersweet moment. You are, when the call came, you're so excited, but you know why the call came, right? Because someone else lost their life. And so that moment is never, ever lost on me that I'm here because someone said yes to donation. Absolutely. Again, thank you, Benita. Um, Benita's story is a part of our Rooted in Life multimedia campaign, and that is an entire campaign that features personal stories of lives touched by donation within the Divine Nine Greek, Lorder, Greek Letter organizations. Um, it's the first of its kind that has all nine organizations and locally all 15 chapters represented, and it includes billboards, videos, podcasts, print materials. There's a traveling banner exhibit. In fact, if you stop by Columbus Public Health right now, you can see one of our banners. We have a year-long commitment with them. Thank you to Dr. Mashika Roberts um, for that opportunity. And you can see um, our banner. They have agreed to put a different banner every month throughout the entire year. Um, if you'd like to learn more about this um, initiative, Rooted in Life, if you are any of our partners here, where can the exhibit be? It doesn't have to be all of the banners. It can just be one banner. Is it in your place of worship? Is it in the lobby? Is it in your place of business? Just that opportunity um, for for us to display um, the stories of donation in partnership with the National Panhellenic Council. Um, and you can visit Lifeline of Ohio forward slash Rooted in Life. Before we begin our conversation with the Wellness Agency, we're so excited about this. I'd like to invite Caroline Inspires back to perform one of her original pieces to honor Black History Month. I reached out to Caroline and I was like, Caroline, I want something special. I want something different, but I want you to be you. And I've not heard it, but I'm excited. Caroline? Who am I? I collect sorrows, stories, and storms and store them in a place where memory and mind are segregated. I remember the bodies of water that cannot separate source from strength, where the sediments of sanity and suffering are transported by the winds of trial and triumph into new seas, where your tears and your songs are as many as the sand. And your sound, a silhouette. Your laughter, more contagious than your weeping. Your weeping, less palatable than your laughter. And your wailing, <laughs> deeper than man's comprehension of God. The bottom of the ocean is your shore and you know safety and survival more than it knows you, a sister's keeper. Your sacrifice is more sacred than a secret. Manifesting into lyrics of love and loss, your acts of labor, birth, grief and gratitude, shape-shifting gloom into glamour, sparkling, shimmering, shining, but never shrinkage. I mean, except for in your hair. <laughs> I definitely foresee you cursing them out through curls and coils every time they ask if it's yours, if it's real, can I touch it? But still, no shrinkage, even in your response. I mean, maybe in your waist because you snatched it to keep from snatching them, but still, no shrinkage. Even when they stare. Your pupils, your pupils have mastered yielding to the light from which you come. You don't know small, not in water, not in space, not next to Biggie. You dang sure don't play it, not even in heat. You expand, dilate 
wider than the gates that lead to destruction. Your hips hold the world when all it did was hurt you. You keep healing it and ain't I proud of you for choosing you when they chose neglect. Your smile cradles your serenity. A sweet sigh passing through your canal, stimulating the pieces of you that they call selfish. And oh, what a mighty, mighty climax when a succulent spirit meets a sincere struggle. They want you in solitude, more lonely than alone. But ain't they know nothing about the stars and sun? It's in your DNA to shine regardless. The NDA just won't let you tell it if you get what I'm saying. They say the body keeps the score. So tell her to speak up a little bit louder for the silence in the back. A little bit prouder for the versions of self she protects. Cheers to her reclaiming her own vignette. Cheers to her many successes that the world tries to forget. Cheers to new beginnings, her place in bets. Cheers to her unapologetic confidence that is inherently a threat. Cheers to not chasing after the people and the jobs who left. Cheers. To her seeing her past as one of her greatest assets. Cheers to her literacies and wisdom. The perfect duet. And cheers to her sound that is no longer a silhouette. Thank you. This is what we do. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. I don't have any sound effects or I would be doing the whoo. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for seeing us. Thank you for honoring us. Thank you. Whew. I know I'm supposed to transition and I will, but that that was that was for the black woman. That was for us. That was for us. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. We appreciate you. Thank you. All right. So our featured partner spotlight is the African-American Male Wellness Agency. Over the past 20 years, the African-American Male Wellness Agency has taken a stance to reduce disparities and premature death and chronic diseases among African-American males by providing more than 4,000 free health screenings yearly and innovative health education programs to include fatherhood, financial health, you got this to reduce preventable health disparity, mental health. It's Our Problem too, a community-based research program and Uplift Her, their women's wellness initiative. As a champion of organ, eye, and tissue donation, the African-American Male Wellness Agency has helped share the importance of becoming an organ donor to thousands of Black families. So now I'd like to please welcome John and Gregory, John Gregory and Pam Gregory, co-founders of the African-American Male Wellness Agency and Kenny Hampton, president of the African-American Male Wellness Agency. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Let, let me first of all, just um, say thank you, uh, Andrew and Demia uh, for allowing us this opportunity to really um, share more with the community in terms of what we do. And to Caroline and Spires, cheers for new beginnings. Um, your words were truly an uh, inspiration. And to me, I can't think of anyone else that really could have done what uh, we just heard Caroline do. So again, thank you for that. Absolutely, absolutely. It's so funny because Pam gonna take Pam gonna do what Pam gonna do. Pam gonna take over your program for what is the best practice at all times. And I love it. I love it. Um, I, I was trying to get a side by side on the screen, but I'm I'm not sure if we can make that happen. But I don't want to belabor. I want to get right into it. So, oh, there we go. So, our first question we have is um, Larice Johnson, our multicultural program manager, is going to ask the first question. Larice, thank you, and good morning. My first question is: How did the wellness agency get its start? Uh, my name is John Gregory, and I am the CEO of the National Center for Urban Solutions. 
which is uh, the Wellness Agency, is one of the entities that we have founded. Uh, this was a workforce project, actually. Uh, we were trying to figure out why Black men uh, between the ages of 18 to 30 uh, had a difficult time going to work. And so with a grant from the United Way and the Columbus Medical Association, we were trying to figure out was it mental or was it physical? And we did a project where we guaranteed about 100 young Black men a job employment. But in order for them to get a paycheck, they had to get a physical every week they picked up their check. After 120 days of being on the project, the nurses came to me and said, John, these guys are sick. Uh, they had high blood pressure. They had cholesterol numbers that were crazy. They had glucose numbers that were crazy. And three of the young men had to go to the emergency room to have emergency surgery. And so after that, somebody said to me, because we are about solutions, somebody said to me, what are we going to do? And I was like, I don't know. What we know is Black men are not going to a conference, they're not going to a seminar, they're not going to do workshops, they don't want to hear all that. And so I looked and said, well, what do white people do? And I looked and I said, oh, you know what? White people walk. They walk for breast cancer, they walk for kidneys, they walk for cats, they walk for food. And I was like, well, why don't we have a walk? And so out of that, uh, we decided we were going to do a, uh, at first we called it a Black men uh, health walk. Um, and we said we was going to walk five miles. I didn't know you really walked 5K. So our first walk, we had it, uh, we organized it in about six weeks. We had about 700 black men show up, and we walked five miles and in the community, through the hood, and afterwards, the black men insisted that we do it again, and the next year we did it again. We had 1,800, and I know we had 1,800, because the director of the neighborhood house counted every person that was out there. And after that, somebody said, well, if we do this again, we need to do this with screenings. The third year, we introduced screenings, and we went from 1,800 to 5,000. So last year, we had over 30,000 people participate. Wow. 30,000. That's incredible. Incredible. Whew. My next question, what are some of the biggest challenges you face when talking to the community about health disparities? Some of the biggest challenges that we face uh, from the community is there is a reality that there's a lot of mistrust. And so what our organization has been able to do in partnership with organizations like Lifeline is to uh, go into the community, have grassroots approach, knocking on doors, and bring the clinic to the community. And let them understand that it's okay to go to the doctor. It's okay to, to learn your numbers. And so our wellness walks have been able to serve as life-saving experiences to thousands of Black men annually so that we can help extend the life expectancy of Black men, which what we know is on average that Black men are dying at age 67 years old. And so by having that relationship uh, or having that trust built by the, or the community, the community seeing us in the uh, community, seeing us engage with the community with a grassroots approach, we're actually able to introduce them to research projects similar to our, our Black Impact, uh, where it's a cardiovascular project where we're helping them uh, learn their numbers and taking them through a, uh, a series of, of things that is going to help them change their, uh, their, their lifestyle. Or it's being able to have a conversation with them uh, within our mental wellness initiative about the importance of men opening up and talking. And uh, with our partnership that we've had with Eric Roberson, which we were introduced by Lifeline of Ohio last year, we're excited because we have men uh, here on, an, on a monthly basis. Hundreds of men are talking about some of the things that they're dealing with uh, that we're able to introduce talk therapy to them. And so the mistrust is starting to... Uh, dissolve, but we know that there's more work for us to do in the community, and that's why we're intentional about going into the community and having our events, to Dr. Davis' point, free, but they're free because of the partnerships that we have with Lifeline of Ohio and several of our other partners in the community. That's awesome. I love what you said about extending the life expectancy of Black males. Um, I, I don't think we fully understand that that's the foundation that all of your work stands on. And so that's um, really powerful. 
I, I do want to, while we're talking about partnerships, I'd like to um, have the um, governing board chair, Mike Voinovich for Lifeline of Ohio, ask the next question. Mike? Hi, thank you. Um, so grateful to have all of you here today as we uh, celebrate uh, Black History Month. So thank you on behalf of the board. Um, we certainly value our partnership with all of you and what you're doing um, in the community and this, you know, in particular for the Black community. Would love to hear um, um, what's important to you about the partnership that you have with, with Lifeline. I think that um, 5,000 men, we know that were screened at our event. 85% of them had high blood pressure. 56% of them didn't even know they had high blood pressure. So what we know is that when people don't know the information, then they can't get the assistance that they need. And so what we have coined, and Mr. Hampton coined this phrase, the clinic to the community, our partnership with Lifeline continues to let us take the clinic to the community. Most Black people don't have conversations about giving um, parts, giving up pieces of their bodies, leaving right. donations. They don't have, see, I can't even say it right. Um, so I think that what Lifeline has done is given us an opportunity to further bring the clinic to the community, to be able to educate individuals in the way that we know how to educate them. We're in 18 cities across the country. And as we go across the country, we are in partnership with Johnson & Johnson doing a campaign called My Health Can't Wait that we could help create this for them. And we're able to now have these conversations in the community about, hey, did you know that um, Black people are three times more likely to need a, a kidney? Uh, and do you also know that we are least less likely to donate a kidney? And most Black people, you know, we just have this conversation with them. They're like, what are you even talking about? So what Lifeline has done, it has given us and from an educational perspective, an opportunity to further our mission in saving Black men's lives and their families. Thank you for that. I I have to tell you this: just within the first year of our partnership, it, I mean, it just exceeded our expectations. We 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 just last year, the the day before the walk, we had Eric Roberson, Master P. Um, and the wellness agency family um, at our facility at Lifeline of Ohio. Um, and it was just such a great event. And we're grateful for that. And we, we, you didn't have to do that. Um, we brought Eric Roberson, but we, you didn't have, you, you gave us Master P and you didn't have to do that. And he was so gracious and kind. And it, it, it wasn't an appearance, it was advocacy in action. And I just want to make sure that we publicly thank you for that. We get that. You didn't have to do that. And we're grateful that you did. Um, and to that, so we'll just, you know, figure out how we get Albie Shore, because I understand you're working with Albie Shore now. And you you did the podcast with Eric Roberson. And, and, and now, I, you know, I, I'm hearing you visiting Eric Roberson. You've been to New Jersey. You're, you, he wrote a song, you know, like I just... I'm like, I'm loving the partnership, but, um, and um, I'm gonna need some of that, um, uh, I'll be sure love uh, my way, some kind of way. And I, and I will say, Pam uh, Gregory um, called me when, when, they, when you were in Washington advocating for patient rights and, and donation. And she called me and I, I do have the picture. I was able to speak with I'll be sure. Um, my high school crush, thank you very much. So um, I appreciate that and I appreciate your work. Um, the next question we have is from Kay Wilson. Kay, are you there? Yes, I'm here. So my question is, can you share uh, what is the difference or if you can share the impact um, between just being a male in America and being an African American American male. Wow, that's a powerful question. Um, I think that let me give you some uh, context. Being a black man in America, uh, when you drive down the street and you see a police car pull up behind you, 
it doesn't matter how innocent you are. You start checking your keys. You start throwing your hands up. You get nervous. You, know, you get that. You get nervous. Uh, the Kensington Court came out a couple of years ago, said that by 2030, black men would be at the bottom of the totem pole in all different kinds of areas, workforce, health, education. So when you say being a black man, you know, and I'm not making excuses, that's why we created the National Center for Urban Solutions to be solution driven. Black men, unfortunately, have the most unimportant role as it seems in this society in America. Nobody really pays attention to the black men. When you talk about young black boys, um, if you go down to the juvenile courts, 90% of the young men down there are black. If you talk about the dropout rate, you talk about young black boys who have been in schools and because of illicit bias and, 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 and those kinds of things, get kicked out of school or suspended more often. So the difficulty for us in this society is that there has been a pre, um, there is already a concept idea out there of who we are and there's a narrative development. And so we're always fighting that narrative. But I think that one of the things that we have been doing here at the African American Well Agency and with um, the National Center for Urban Solutions, we are really fighting to make sure that people understand that those narratives that have been created for us are false. Um, that we do have lots of black men that are in college. We have, I mean, our organization, the National Center for Urban Solutions, we hire almost over 70 young black men under the age of 45, most of them have a college education. Most of them do not have any kind of record. But I think that the narrative out there about black men, well, what we've seen on TV, what we heard people talk about, is that they really believe what they see. And so we're always fighting to overcome that narrative. And I think that through our agency over the 18 cities that we have been in, what people get excited about is they see the leadership that these organizations that we think that we're doing across the country, it's engaging, involving black men. And people are always excited when they go like, you all can get that many black men to come out at seven o'clock in the morning and we don't have no drama, no nothing. We are always like, yeah, that's what it is because this is who we really are. We are men, you know, when you think of all the interventions that go on the traffic lights you stop at, the bicycles that people ride, the luggage that you pull in the airport, the first heart transplant, you think about all those things, all those things were created by black men. And so we are really working hard to change that narrative that this country does not seem to want to let go. That's powerful. Thank you. I, I wanna ask that same question um, of Pam Gregory for women. The question was, oh, Kay, do you have the question? Yeah. Can you share the difference between being a woman in America and being an African-American woman? Um, I don't really think it's, it's much different. Uh, we have learned even over the last three years uh, with Uplift Her that there, again, is a trust factor. Uh, when you look at the mortality uh, rate for women who um, are conceiving or pregnant, um, while it has decreased for um, white women, it has increased for black women, the same with breast cancer and cardiovascular disease. And so, you know, that was really the birth of Uplift Her because as we're doing the initiative for black men, we realize that really from a health disparity perspective, it's the same for black women. And so that has really been our charge to make sure that we continue to create that awareness in the black community for both men and women because we are, we're faced with really the same issues. Powerful, absolutely. And we, we also support um, Uplift Her as well as um, the Male Wellness Agency. Okay, I'm gonna mix it up a little bit. It's Valentine's Day. It's Valentine's Day. What you listening to? What you listening to? What's, what's, what's your song? What's that song you have to play today? for Valentine's Day. No, this was not in your notes, but this is what we do. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I'm gonna give a shout out to my guy, Eric Roberson, Lessons Remix. Um, that, that song right there, 
if you have the opportunity to really listen to the lyrics, and I shared this with them while you were telling everybody that we done been in this house and hung out with them. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I have shared it with them that it's not just about a love that you have found, but it's also about where you may be in life and how the things that you have gone through have led you to that space of arrival of, I, I get it. I see why all these things were played an important part. And these weren't losses in life. There were lessons. And today I would like to share that message on, a, I guess, a quote unquote love day that um, these are lessons that we're going through and they're all leading us to some great places. Awesome. We couldn't have said it better. And Eric Roberson has just been so kind with um, his advocacy for um, organized tissue donation and just uh, health and wellness in the black community. I, I do have a question that it's it's not an easy question, but it's an honest one. What keeps you up at night? And how do we, and that's Lifeline of Ohio, that's any of the other partners out there, how do we partner together to tackle that issue? What keeps me up at night, on, I guess in this space that we're in, is the fact that it's amazing that we are able to impact the thousands of African-American men and their families on an annual basis, but there's so many more. And there's lots of opportunity and sometimes I have to challenge myself to dig deeper and challenge our organization to dig deeper because we're literally saving lives with the work that we're doing. And so having the opportunity to be in 18 cities across 12 different states doing the work that we're doing, standing in that gap with organizations like Lifeline Ohio uh, to bring information that's life-saving or to bring the products or the tools and technology to ultimately save lives that's what's keeping us up at night is the fact that there's organizations looking for this type of partnership and we just got to continue to press forward and avail ourselves so that we, with the trust that we have built with the community, can together go into the community and say, it's okay to engage and to learn this information that's ultimately going to extend the life expectancy of you and the members of your family. So uh, Mia, I'd like to answer that question from a different perspective because I do get up at night at two, three o'clock in the morning. And I think that one of the things that keeps me up is how do we continue to fund what we do? And how do we keep, take that funding that allows us to do it in a very non-traditional way? And I think that when people are out there, you know, there are organizations out there that individuals give $10 million to do the work that we do. And they go like, here's $10 million for three years. And we are constantly finding ourselves knocking on doors and doing things that we got to do just to get $5,000 that some organizations are going to get $100,000 for. So for me, it's always about, if because our heart is in this. Um, Pam and I, from the agency perspective, do not get a dime from that agency. And so we are committed to 18 cities across the country, taking the stuff in the community, making sure people get free health screens, making sure that women get free health screens, making sure kids programs, making sure that we're doing research projects that, that black men and or black individuals are showing up to participate in. And so when you look at that, you have to think in terms of how do you fund that? And how do you go tell your message? How do we go get, you know, when you look at the Susan Coleman um, um, group, you know, they have people who just write a million dollar checks. And in our community, we don't have people writing a million dollar checks and saying, hey, my sister died, here's a million dollars for you to continue this. So for us to state what we do, from a community perspective, it, it keeps me up to figure out how do we keep doing this and making it be of quality? Because no one has ever been to any of our events. I can tell you this, the fire department said this to us, we have one of the most organized events that they see of that size in the city of Columbus. And how do we do that? Well, you know, our staff has to volunteer time, we get community volunteers to volunteer, but in order to continue that work, we have to continue to find the funding that allows us to do that. Yeah, I would just ask that, uh, because we really do stay up at night. It's funny that, you know, John and I, we're, we're up at three or four o'clock in the morning, really trying to figure out how do we make sure that we continue to support the community in the manner that we do. We're not a line item on anyone's budget. And so, you know, we're truly um, entrepreneurs in that way. So we're not your uh, typical 
uh, uh, agency in the community where we had to really build from the ground up. And so really making sure that uh, we continue to expand the relationships like we have with Lifeline and other organizations to make sure from a funding perspective that we're still able to provide the services free to the community. Absolutely. That's so powerful. And I'm so, gl I'm so glad you mentioned that about funding and also research because we don't necessarily think of your role in research. So I found that um, really fascinating to understand how often you participate and you're a go-to for organizations for research as it relates to the Black community and health. Um, so thank you for that. I, our final question, and we have a few minutes left and still have to close us out, but we cannot leave without you telling us your favorite success story or something that you're proud of um, as it relates to your work. I can tell you, I have a success story. So there was this guy who came up to me uh, not too long ago, and he said, Mr. Gregory, Mr. Gregory. I said, yeah. He said, I just want to thank you. I said, thank you for what? But he said, you saved my life. He said, I was driving down the street, and I looked up on this billboard, and I saw that you were having this event. And this was the day of the event. And he was like, oh, I wish I would have went. He said, and then on the radio, I heard them say, come get free health screenings. He said, so I went to get the free health screening. He said, I got in the line, was getting health screened, and got screened, and the doctor said to me, you need to go to the emergency room right now. He said, I had to have a triple bypass heart surgery. He said, I am here today, 15 years later, because of that event that you had. He said, and I have become every year and bring everybody I know because it truly saved my life. We hear them kind of stories every single day. If it hadn't been for the free health screens that you got, I wouldn't be here today. So that is one of the most successful stories I have. I don't know if Pam or Kenny has one. Yeah, my most recent, um, most of you probably know that we started as Dropout Recovery High School. It's called the Academy for Urban Scholars High School. So really our mission is threefold. When you look at it from an education perspective, a health and wellness perspective, and a workforce a solution perspective, this past June, we graduated um, a young man, his mother, and his grandmother. So we graduated three generations. You know, the, her, the grandmother was, I think, 68 years old, who never thought that she would have the opportunity to get a high school diploma. So the impact that we're making generationally, that to me really is how we move the community forward from a health perspective, a workforce perspective, and an education perspective. That's legacy work. And I'll just share and add to that is that one of the success stories that is, is very powerful within our organization is that we often say internally that we're more than a walk, right? Um, and so what we've been able to do over the last couple of years, we've been able to partner with Abbott Labs and take free continuous glucose monitors to the Black community. Uh, we've taken hundreds of those to the community, and we're excited because we've been able, because of the success that we've had in that space of not just uh, bringing that product and that technology, but bringing the education that comes with that. I grew up watching my grandmother prick her finger uh, several times a day, right? But now there's technology that you can just put a patch on your arm and you're able to monitor your, your glucose real time. We're able to now uh, announce that that project or that pilot has been extended. Uh, we are in conversations with other organizations that are wanting to bring that same type of opportunity to the Black community. And so along with the funding uh, opportunities that we are always looking for, we're excited to be able to have partners that see the value in partnering with NCUS and with the African American Health Wellness Agency to disseminate life-changing information, but also life-changing products to the community free of cost. And Demia, I do want to say this too before you close. And our other success story is we met you. And if we had not met you, we wouldn't have this knowledge and information about donors. Mm -hmm. And so that is that to me has been a tremendous success because up until the time we met you and you're and you know you you and Pam don't kind of cut out of the same cookie um, mold. You're gonna be pushing, you're gonna get your way, it's gonna be your way or no way. And because you are who you were, we now are engaged in this work. And so for that, we thank you. Oh, my goodness. 
Thank you. Thank you. Let's give the wellness agency a round of applause. I'm, I'm so grateful for everything that you have, you're doing for this community. I'm so grateful for our partnership. And I just, just from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of the entire staff of Lifeline of Ohio, every volunteer, every board member, staff, every community member, thank you for sharing this message, taking our message with you everywhere you go. So it is one o'clock. It's time for us to wrap up. I thank you again. Um, you can visit the wellness agency online. And Larice, if you could close us out in about 10 seconds, because I like to be done on time. Larice. Thank you, Demia. And thank you to everyone who has joined us on behalf of Lifeline of Ohio's DEI committee. Thank you for celebrating Black History Month with us. Thank you to the Wellness Agency. Thank you to Caroline Inspires. Thank you to our boards of staff, volunteers, um, and everyone who joined us today. To learn more about the Wellness Agency, please visit aawellness.org. And to become a registered organ, eye, and tissue donor today, visit lifelineofohio.org. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.